Welcome, netizens, terrestrials. My name is Natasha Tsakos. Thank you for being here with us to discuss a timely topic, enhancing digital experiences in the postmodern world. And boy, do we need it. Joining us right now is an incredible panel of visionaries, really. And my introductions will not do them justice, but please feel free to cheer them on as I introduce them. We have Martine Attel, CEO of VoteBash, a global social voting platform for the voter. Isaac Castro, co-founder and CTO of Emerge, bringing touch and emotion to extended reality experiences. Dioselin Gonzalez, founder of Imagine to Reality, an independent VR AR consulting company, previously head of research at Unity and software architect at Microsoft Research. Dan Mapes, founder of Versus.io and co-author of The Spatial Web, a web 3.0 will connect humans, machines, and AI to transform the world. Carl Meta, founder and CEO of Edcast, an AI-powered knowledge cloud for on-demand access to curated and expert knowledge. And Michael Strong, founder of Expanse Online and regarded as one of the most experienced designers of highly innovative school programs here in the United States. Welcome, everyone. So the COVID-19 pandemic has illustrated and still does how the audiovisual medium um, has become the default technology to facilitate many-to-many -many links. And yet we are missing subtleties, senses, uh, physiological, physical, philosophical dimensions and interactive dynamics. So my question for all of you is, how can we best enhance our digital experiences so that we may en enhance our own and what technologies you might converge in that, make, that will make them richer? Um, Martijn, we will start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Wonderful to be here at the RASS event. It's an honor. And one of the things that we are working on at uh, Vote Bash is to connect people through their opinions. And once we have profiled the world through opinions, we think uh, the next step would be to connect people who have similar opinions or at least a multitude of data points that converge so that we can develop some kind of AI that bring people together based on their opinions rather uh, based on their differences. And uh, we hope that we can bring that into some kind of streaming format. So the two keywords that we have here is vote best vision, where we want to bring uh, a new kind of space of engagement in two to three years from now uh, in its initial testing phase. And hopefully that will be something that we can then um, plug in into virtual reality and other media. Natasha, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I am the co-founder and CTO of Emerge, a technology company that is empowering people to build more meaningful bonds with the people that we care about across distance and time by bringing emotion to our virtual interactions, right? Our goal is to create a new standard for shared digital experiences that can allow us to strengthen our relationships with the people that we care about. And the first step towards that vision is basically focus on touch with a product that allows the user to physically feel, interact, and share immersive experiences and content with others. But why do we think this is important for us? Right? During the pandemic and the physical distancing, we, all, we also, and a huge need uh, for human connection, right? But this wasn't a new issue at all for us. The numbers were already very alarming. Back in early uh, 2020, even before the pandemic, a national survey here in the US said that almost 80% of the Gen Z, 70% of millennials, and 50% of baby boomers feel lonely. Technology still limits us when we need to feel fully present with the people that we care about, when we can be physically together with them, right? 
you know, I'm, I, I was born in Spain. I've been an immigrant my, my whole life, living in Greece, uh, Natasha, Germany, Colombia, and, and now in the U.S. And I always had my parents, the, my friends and family, the, the people that I really care about, thousands of miles away. And, and I'm grateful for this technology such as Skype and Zoom and, and other platforms like Facebook. But with time, I realized that they are not enough. It's really limiting and, and difficult to feel present with the people that you care about with current platforms where connection is just about voice and a screen, right? When I met my co-founder Sly and Mauricio, hi Sly, already six years ago, we decided to create a platform that would be driven by emotion. And the sense of, sense of touch we know is, 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 is a core pillar in how we transmit our emotions, right? We, we often don't think about it and, and we don't discuss it, but touch is essential for us humans. Our hands, our, uh, our, our primitive interface since we are born, no? it's how we explore our world. It helps us transmit our emotions and our feelings. It increases empathy and bonding. Right? We can speak volumes to each other through a simple touch. Right? Think about a comforting hug or a, or a loving caress. Right? So our first product, what we've been working on for the last few years, the M1, we call it, uses ultrasound to produce a force field that can be overlaid onto virtual content. And this is VR, AR, 2D content, to make it tangible. In the same way, when you go to a concert and you feel the waves of sound on your chest, we are able to manipulate the ultrasound to generate enough pressure that you can feel on your hands. So the user wears a VR headset, a, a virtual reality headset, and is able to physically feel me there with bare hands, so no need of uh, gloves or controllers. It's able to physically feel the virtual content in front of them and share that tangible experience with someone else in the distance, in, in real time. Imagine being able to hold the hand of your grandmother no? or to give your daughter a caress across the country or to play, to play a game with someone across the world that you can feel on your hands. Imagine a virtual high five. That is the vision that we are working on at Emerge. That's awesome, Isaac, and, and exactly like you were saying, like by adding that, you know, touch and other sense to our experience, like just audio and, and video, uh, it adds so much dimension, right? And, and it, it, it is said that um, emotion, um, touch and smell are one of the primary senses for memories, right? For recollecting memories. So. All right, um, I am a software engineer, and I've been doing virtual reality since the early 2000s, since when Oculus didn't exist, and so in academia. And so since then, I've been doing that, working mostly in um, known games, uh, the scientific research, military simulation, and tools. And recently, I've been working with Unity Labs, um, doing tools, and Microsoft Research, doing scientific research. And I am now, I decided to go independent because it's a time for me, especially the, where we are right now, um, to do really the projects that are about redefining or, or defining like what virtual reality should be, not just what it is. Because right now the moment is it's awesome. And also because I've always had a passion for diversity, so I'm also working with nonprofits to do uh, virtual reality, you know, this get the digital divide, you know, uh, small. Uh, regarding how to uh, our experiences today, you know, Zoom meetings and all these uh, meetings, uh, audio and video. I hear people uh, talking a lot about Zoom fatigue, and I think it's kind of funny because work meetings have always been boring and exhausting. So I don't, I, I don't think that you know we really need to make them more exciting. That's that's. <laughs> technology thing, that's more like a management, right, a human thing. But I do agree that um, we need to make them in the business side more uh, effective, right? Uh, we're just talking heads, we don't have the body, body language, right? And then being able to actually read the room, right? Like, what does it mean to read the room when, when we're in this? Um, and then, of course, when in, not, when personal meetings, evidently, right? That's why the word Isaac was saying, you know, the sense of touch is not there, that, you know, being together is not there. So for that, I am betting on augmented reality more than virtual reality. Um, in augmented reality, so that way we can mix that and we don't totally go to a new world but actually get together in the physical world because I do believe that's very important and it will make it 
more uh, personal. Um, because the way our representation will be just us instead of an avatar that could take any any shape. And I believe that is that is going to be combined with what you know environmental sensors. Um, and that's what people are calling them together ambient computing these days. You know, sensors that are around the room that you know can look at me and see what the room it is and, and or the room in, with other people are and then reproduce it for me. And maybe even, you know, besides uh, devices, you know, all around doing uh, for me to being able to sense. Imagine, um, well, this is kind of like an extreme example, but imagine somebody raising their voice in, you know, in a meeting and then being able to actually feel like, ooh, you know, that person is actually, uh, which is amazing, right? Which is, it, it's about that, what you were saying, Natasha, the, the subtleties of it. And so it's, it's making it effective more than fun in my, in my sense. Thank you, Diosa. Uh, yeah, uh, it's wonderful, wonderful uh, gathering here. Uh, so pleasant to share with you all today. Uh, I think when we go out 500 years from now and look back at human history, uh, there will only be two major events that stand out as uh, the two key events in human history. One will be the discovery of fire and how to handle fire, and the other will be post-human level artificial intelligence. And our company is the leader in uh, artificial general intelligence at the moment in the world. Um, our chief scientist is Dr. Carl Friston uh, from University College London, and uh, he shortlisted one of the top three candidates for a Nobel Prize in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, we're doing extraordinary breakthrough work in, in advanced AI. And what, what that means is that uh, instead of giving everybody a... Uh, uh, an Apple computer or a laptop or a uh, smartphone, we're going to give everybody charges. Everybody's going to have more AI at personal disposal than the largest corporations and government agencies have today. AI is exploding. Uh, by 2030, we'll have uh, artificial general intelligence that will be mimicking human intelligence. And uh, from there, of course, it just takes off. So then we'll have augmented intelligence. That means humans and AIs working together inside virtual worlds because the entire world will actually be virtualized at that point through spatial computing. And so the AIs will actually inhabit the space and they'll make our supply chains run better, deliver our food, guarantee the quality, uh, do income distribution, all kinds of things that we can't even imagine yet. Uh, and uh, really we'll enter a post-work environment where you don't really drive to work anymore because the AIs and the robots are handling all the manual labor and all the physical labor, and even what we call thinking labor. So we're then released to rise to a higher level of creativity, of uh, maybe even transformational experiences, things like that. So it's the age of AI that we're stepping into and it will change, it will, it will make what we're doing today right now look like the Stone Age looks like to us. That's what's coming. Wow. <clears throat> if I may interrupt before Carl takes over, I, if we're not speaking, can I, can I suggest we turn our mics off because there's a little bit of feedback happening across all the... Thank you. Wow, Dan, uh, your vision is uh, very bold and powerful. I had heard uh, the CEO of Google say, AI is the next thing after electricity. You're saying it's the next thing right after fire. So that's amazing. Uh, well, so my name is uh, Carl Mehta, uh, founder and CEO of Edcast. Nice to meet you all. Thank you for inviting. Uh, uh, we're doing something very basic, nothing very futuristic, which is to make people productive in the digital world. We are all doing three activities on digital. We are collaborating using the Zooms and the Microsoft Teams of the world. We all have to continuously learn. We all have to be a continuous learner in today's world. And then we are working. We have to do an actual work as well besides collaborating. And uh, what my company is doing is using AI and machine learning um, and bringing collaborating, learning, and working these three activities together into a single unified activity so that all of us can be very productive, more productive, we can have less fatigue and we can learn in the flow of work and we can actually dish out new work to brand new people who wants to come in into uh, the workforce in, a, in new skills because the skills are continuously changing. 
and you sh- uh, anybody should be able to learn fast. We all have to be fast learners and pick up new skills because the old skills are going away. It's like a skin, you know, old skin goes away, new skin comes in. So that's that's uh, what we're working on. And uh, we are about six year in the business, 300 plus people worldwide and over 200 large fortune 1000 companies using our platform or uh, four, four million plus people. Thank you. <clears throat> cool. So um, I'm delighted to have all of this other cool stuff to play with. Um, I focus uh, on intellectual dialogue in the classroom. So for 30 years, I've trained middle school students whom I regard as wonderful puppies, but they're bouncy all over the place to learn how to have civilized, respectful intellectual dialogue. And I've kind of resisted the tech thing because I love the human to human thing. But now, thanks to you guys and the work of others, we can go human to human in an ever deeper sense in the virtual space. So I'll give you a couple of technologies we're working on integrating. One is Immersion Neuro by Paul Zak, which measures real-time attention. Our students measure, yeah, it's like a Fitbit, we use Skosh, but we can actually get real-time measures of exactly how attentive. So if you are ever bored in class or you're in a business meeting and somebody's boring, now we have real-time. <laughs> who's interesting and who's not? Really cool. Uh, Riff Analytics is another company kind of derived from MIT Media Lab technology that gives real-time information on who's influencing whom, who's dominating whom, um, who's interrupting whom. And it's uh, the CEO. on your cell phone you can say at minute 455 Carl said this and you know have your favorite emoji um, and then finally as we integrate all of this uh, into uh, goggles we're starting to have our staff meetings in oculus you can imagine with the goggles real-time measures of the immersion of the interruptions and so forth and the annotations so uh, while we're meeting with other people we get the experience of all of this data And I see this as a way to train people. My goal is in 2035, no more yucky, boring meetings, no more yucky, boring classrooms. And actually, we can refine the quality of human interaction at scale. And ultimately, I think there are different ways to have cool interaction at scale. I can imagine like a Spotify list of our favorite styles of human interaction that's tech-enabled, tech-optimized, no more jerks anywhere. And yeah, boy, I can't wait to incorporate the stuff you guys are doing to make this vision even more fun and cool. So thank you. I love this idea of this this Spotify playlist of human interactions. That sounds, I mean, you could take this to so many different levels. Oh, this is fantastic. Um, okay, so I, I'm tempted to dive deeper, but before I do want to ask you one question, uh, because I think we'll have we'll have time to go a little deeper. So, as experts in your field, and and you speak a lot at conferences, you give interviews. And I, I'm sure uh, the questions tend to be often the same. Um, but what? So what are questions that you are not asked enough, and that we should be asking you, and why? Okay, I think uh, the, the the question that almost no one asks is, what can we do to help you uh, mm. make this vision come to life, and especially. You know, I can uh, very much relate to everyone here. We're all pioneers. Some of us are immigrants. um, And then you are in an ecosystem. And then it's very important that people have diversity in in entrepreneurship, diversity in finding the solutions and and making uh, things possible for entrepreneurs like myself and you. And... uh, And and why not? Because if we don't help other people to rise as well, we might not tap in in all the solution power that the world is giving us. And I think that is very important that uh, we always ask ourselves these questions. What can we do to help each other? What can we do to um, make your vision come to life? Yeah, agree with Martin. I think uh, two things. One is... uh, based on Silicon Valley demographics here, uh, we always get criticized uh, of lack of diversity in the in Silicon Valley, both in technology and in venture capital, both uh, gender diversity, lack of gender diversity, lack of um, minority. So I think we got to <clears throat> keep bringing those questions 
um, so then it will get addressed and uh, it has to be heard and uh, everyone needs to practice that. So I think that's uh, problem number one that uh, from a people standpoint, we need to solve. And second, from a um, technology standpoint, I think it's uh, we all love, we are all dreamers and we come up with all this technology vision. But I think the biggest hurdle is always adoption curves. And, uh, you know, the leading edge is also the bleeding edge. And so many times you actually fail because you are too early. I've had many moments, many times in my past 25 years in the Valley where I was too ahead of the time. And so we need to address what can we do to create that change management and be able to take people from here to there in terms of all this new, fantastic uh, technological innovations that are coming in. But we need to address the human side of that technology innovation to be able to take people from where they are. Otherwise, we can all dream up stuff, but we will also fail from an adoption standpoint because not everybody is ready to, to change. Mm. Actually, just bouncing off that a little bit, um, I'm very interested in the whole field of venture philanthropy because a lot of the coolest things need help early on and they're very speculative. Um, and I think uh, philanthropists need to increasingly realize a lot of the coolest stuff is speculative and they need to have lots of speculative bets, some of which may not scale. And so the whole notion that impact is necessarily at scale misses the point of the early cool stuff may not be at scale for another mm -hmm. five or 10 years, but um, I'd love to have more philanthropists imagining and asking about what should we be investing in now that may be at scale five to 10 years from now. Uh, I can go next. Um, by the way, it was so it was so exciting to to hear your your work, your stories. is so impressive. I'm so fortunate to be here with you all. By the way, Michael, uh, I know Paul Sack. He's he's a friend of mine. Uh, he's great, great human being. He's a great human being for sure. Uh, so yeah, in my case, I, a lot of people ask uh, about the future in terms of digital experiences. No, and I think the most successful special experiences will be associated with a stronger connections between people. No, so. To me, a very interesting question is, what should we be building right now to prioritize for those stronger bonds? And if we look back in, 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 in time, in, in the last 200 years, yes, we've seen a profound progress in communication, right? Telegram, the phone, the internet, and the video calls. But we are still, if you think about it, very limited to two senses, right? Sight and sound. And one of the things that I learned when living as an immigrant and last year uh, during the pandemic is that I was very well connected with many people, but on a superficial level, right? We like each other's photos, we comment on new events, and even talk to each other over video calls if we want, right? But to me, over the years, those, those Zoom calls, those video calls, became a reminder of how really distant I was from the people that I care about, right? We all have suffered from, from this problem, this situation during the pandemic, and I can imagine that most of you have family and friends miles away right now, right? But as an immigrant, I became an expert living this way, right? And that physical distance becomes emotional distance, like my, my co-founder Mauricio likes to say. And coming back to the AR and VR world that, that Dioselin knows, knows so, so well, yes, VR and, and AR hold the promise to be at the core of how we'll connect, how we'll work, how we'll communicate in the next decade. And actually, the top five uh, most valuable companies in the world have now AR and VR as a priority. Actually, last, last week or a couple of weeks ago, Facebook announced that 10,000 of their employees out of a total of 58,000 are working on AR and VR, right? And, and both Facebook and Apple are going to be releasing their classes really soon, probably Facebook this year. Immersive experiences, yes, will be immersed and merged with our surroundings, but this is a core belief that we have. We believe that only if those platforms are able to transmit much more than just sight and sound, those platforms will become the shifting paradigm technologies that the telegram or the phone or the internet were at their time, right? And this is something that we, call, we, we, we deeply believe. In five years from now, instead of video calling someone, I would love to just be able to see the person in a holographic form in front of me and, and to be able to physically feel the person. And a little bit further into the future, the holy grail for communication will be to transmit our feelings, our emotions to someone else. Right? Being able to feel how my mother is feeling right now or my daughter, I think that is what will take us to the next level in human connection. 
And, that, and that's, that's basically the, 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 the goal, the future that we are building at Immerse, right? We want to be able to transmit much more than words or, or a smile, no? our emotions. And we believe that sending the sense of touch is, is the first step toward that, that future. I think uh, one of the things that uh, we get lulled into a little bit is we don't realize that the pace of change keeps increasing. Uh, if we go from the original Internet in 1970 uh, to the World Wide Web, there was a pace of change there where Apple Computer came out in 1978, and it slowly grew with PCs. And then when the World Wide Web came in, it got faster, and then with mobile phones, it got faster. Now it's going to get faster again. But there is the big problem that we're not talking about, and that is – Half the jobs are gone in the next five to 10 years. They're gone. And so we have a massive problem uh, at a government level on uh, reskilling and training and uh, income distribution and other things. This is going to hit every developed country harder because all the white collar jobs and all the factory jobs are being wiped out by artificial intelligence and robotics. And we don't, under we don't have the social programs to handle that. And it's coming, it's not coming like from the World Wide Web till today is 25 years. And from the mobile phone to today is 12 years. But this stuff is coming at us in five to seven years. I mean, from, night, from 2030 even until we're, we're going to see a massive disruption. And so what Carl's doing and I think what Michael's doing around new kinds of education, new approaches, these are going to become central because how do we really help our, help our society deal with this massive impact. It isn't just cute little VR devices we're building. These are holograms. We're going to be living inside an artificially intelligent driven hologram that's organizing our supply chains, our ports, our hospitals, running our factories, running our warehouses, everything. Oh my God. And nobody knows it. Not hardly even anybody on this call. I mean, you kind of hear about it. No, it's coming faster and more powerful than you can imagine, like a freight train, like a tsunami. And we are not prepared for it. And it's going to cause a massive disruption at government levels, at social levels. That's what's coming, guys. Now, just actually to talk about social mobility a little bit, one of the things I'm most interested in is how to transmit cultural capital more effectively and more quickly. Because I think traditional schooling is a mostly obsolete skills at this point. Whereas, you know, I, I've spent most of the last 20 years in Austin and San Francisco, and the social capital you get, even as a teenager living in Austin and San Francisco, is extraordinary. So how do we help the rural kid in Kansas, the rural kid in Senegal, kids around the world have access to the social capital? And this is where I think the kind of interactions we're talking about potentially can at scale allow access to the most elite kinds of social capital anywhere. You know, how to get there is a lot of work, but certainly I see a huge kind of social mobility play based on the scalability of what we're talking about. Um, adding to what uh, Martin and Dan, Dan were saying, it's like, yes, I would like people to, to ask me more about, like, and have a sense of urgency. Like, what's, what? tell me more. Tell me VR beyond games. I mean, that's just a part of it. Um, what, and, and also, I would like people in, in, to take a more active role in defining virtual reality. We, the engineers, the programmers, yes, yeah, we're implementing it. But don't let us just define what it's going to be. Um, in talking about, you know, postmodernism and modernism and about, you know, what is reality? This is, this is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to define what is reality going to be in the future? You know, are we going to accept that, that the digital beings that are run by, by you know, like Dan was saying, running by AI, are we going to be accepted that as a real and, you know, entities and all, and where are the implications of that? I would like to talk more about the, you know, the philosophical and psychological aspects of virtual reality, because right now we're in a perfect, perfect time to actually, you know, this is, it's not new, you know, it's not new, but what is new is all this engagement of all the society, you know, living it together. Um, so that's what I would like to, to talk more and, and, and people tell me, tell me what they want virtual reality to be. Mm -hmm. That's a nice one. That's a very nice one. I love it. It, 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 it rings, it's, it aligns very much to what I've been seeing, reading and, and hearing you talk even. And 
Actually, I, I did have a question, which is like you seem to have a very human centric approach to the way that you're devising these um, extended reality experiences. And I'm wondering what are as a as a developer and a creator, what are your own parameters to differentiate the gimmicks from the from the discovery that really brings value to to the user? Because sometimes it can be tricky. Sometimes the, the, the gimmicks can be so seductive and playful that it's like, ah, oh. but one just is, is purely superficial and the other one is meaningful. What, what, how do you differentiate the two? Yeah, uh, when I, I always like, I want all of us to ask our questions is, what are we redefining by doing this? When it's a gimmick, it's like, I'm, I'm having fun. But if we ask this, like, what is the reimagining? What is the redefining that I'm doing here or that, you know, the developers are giving me the opportunity mm -hmm. when, when they're doing this? Um, in, in, uh, and again, we, we have this like human centered, like you were saying, right? Like that's also like postmodern, like, you know, the reality comes from in, inside and all. And I was reading actually preparing for the panel that, um, Philosophers are not really agreeing on what comes after postmodernism. They agree that we're starting like a new era, but they don't know exactly what to call it. But they seem to be agreeing in that now uh, reality is also defined by a little bit of mysticism. It seems like humanity <laughs> is, you know, awakening to that, like kind of going back a little bit. Mm. So. Uh, if this is where we're going, so that what does it make sense in this um, in virtual experiences? Again, like how am I representing and bringing, you know, this new reality uh, in the new society that we are, and how does that fit? No, I, I, think, I think I think you put your finger right on it. That is the key issue because the the whole history of the Earth is the story of evolution, and so. If you look at virtual reality with artificial intelligence in it, it's the hottest evolutionary environment we've ever had. Our minds are going to expand. We have CRISPR technology right now. We can do word processing on the DNA. Our bodies are going to change. We're going to get rid of all cancer by 2050. Most diseases will be gone. We might extend our lifespans to 150 or 200 or 300 years. We're on the dawn of a renaissance. This is a golden age we're stepping into. It's also really scary because we've got a lot of dumb people and they've got guns and weapons and things. So we've got to like heal the crazies and celebrate the evolutionary path and use these technologies uh, for evolution. And, and by the way, it's the driving force of everything anyway. What is technology? Just watch it over the last 75 years since the first computer came in in 1944 uh, when uh, to help crack the German cipher code and win that war. Uh, they're just evolving, and we're, and we're in the middle of a hot evolution. So we're doing nothing. It's doing it to us. We're just part of it. Some of us are smart enough to tap into it and build more things to help it grow, but it's evolving whether we like it or not. It's coming at us like a freight train. That's the future. We're evolving. These, these virtual realities are, man, they're going to make school look like uh, carving on a cave wall, you know. You're, you're, in, you're interacting in three dimensions with an AI and how guiding you, self-paced learning, individuated for everybody on the planet for free, better than a Harvard education. That's going to change the world. And we want to make sure. Well, I was going to say, and we want to make sure that, that we do get this going in a positive direction in terms of creativity and warmth and connection. Because I, I immediately think of the dystopian alternative, you know, already things like Grand Theft Auto and, you know, first person shooter games and violent and degrading porn. Sadly, there are going to be some really ugly um, experiences coming out of this, too. And in terms of this evolutionary ecosystem, how can we set up the ecosystem so the more positive kinds grow more rapidly um, rather than the negative kinds? And yeah, I mean, when, when I hear you guys saying, I'm like, yes, yes, <laughs> that sense of urgency, because uh, right now we, we are starting this. We, we're actually re defining again. We are saying, what, what is, is it really the next going to be a uh, computing platform? Uh, and so we need to ask those questions. And we all know that the way that we create the technology, the way that we from scratch we created that influences how people see the world and how they see themselves. For example, um, is the internet safe? If you ask, you know, women like me, dark women would say no. 
And, you know, one of the reasons is, you know, TCP IP, the protocol never didn't have, you know, security into account when it was created. You know, there's a lot, the way it is, you know, you can personate very easy a website, you know, that was the, the whole fishing. So that's why we need to start like that, like saying, like knowing that, not like Dan was saying, don't let it happen to you. Let's go and actually define it for us. I guess that's my word of the day, define well, I mean, uh, I'm hearing all of you guys, and I think um, uh, I agree with uh, everything that you guys said. And uh, the central piece of all that is really trust, uh, because uh, in the digital experience, virtual world, I mean, we are lacking trust even in the physical community today. Uh, the lot to be done there. And then the digital experience is, um, you know, I mean, right now, if you look at social media, it's still like uh, to borrow, uh, you know, the metaphor. It feels like the caveman type uh, time, time, because people are shouting at each other, screaming at each other on Twitter. People are writing completely inflated resumes uh, on LinkedIn. You can really trust um, on even the current state of the social media. It needs to go from the uh, the, the Stone Age to you know where all this technology today exists. So, but all that requires fund fundamentally establishing an identity and credentialing to the level where we can really trust each other. I get a million, um, I mean, literally the hundreds of uh, in, in, mess uh, in mail messages on LinkedIn with people, great entrepreneurs who want to get funding and things like that. And I feel so sad that I don't even reply to them. And I don't, e I don't even know who to trust. <laughs> Right. Even though, sure, I can click on that. I can see their background on LinkedIn. Sure, I can see some 14 people or 1,400 people common, but that doesn't mean anything. Right. So I think we we still have to use fundamentally AI machine learning to be able to establish the people to people trust so that we can really collaborate and work together in the digital virtual world and then make a lot of these things. I think the technology exists, but there is a big trust deficit and there is a lot to be solved over there. Totally, that, that's, a, that's a great point. And actually, I will say trust. And let's don't forget that um, uh, technology is here to serve us, right? Yeah. Uh, when, when I was listening to, to, to Dan's uh, opinion, which, which is mind blowing, right? Um, uh, it got me really excited. But out of the sudden, you, you kind of forget that the technology is here for us, no? yeah. not, not the other way around. So how well, and can this point about yeah, and that's the point about my. I think Dan, you were saying, and Michael, you were saying about you know dumb people with guns. So we got to be very careful about AI and ethical AI. So there is a there's a lot more to be done again on the ethical side of the AI because as much as we we are building all this great technology, but they are also going in a direction that that can destroy humanity very easily. And we are seeing that even like the small fraction of it, like I see it with my. Uh, with my teenager kids and uh, how much technology can be destructive to them, like the way they are addicted to uh, an Instagram or a Snapchat and how much Instagram can change your self-worth for a 16-year-old girl and how much she now spends time on her facial picture and trying to look totally different than what she is. I mean, it's just disaster. Right? It's destructive uh, to the society. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we need to address that part of it as well, which is that, you know, hey, how much is technology really de de destroying humanity and has a bad effect on mental health of the people? And is are we programming the AI for ethical um, ethical reasons? Uh, and in fact, uh, we, we, ag we agree with you, Carl. I mean, we're playing around uh, at, uh, in our company you know, with, the mo with the most powerful technologies ever created, way more powerful than any gun or missile. Uh, it's artificial general intelligence used badly. It could really be a problem, as we've seen from science fiction movies, from Terminator to HAL, to all kinds of things. Obviously, we're building Jarvis, which is a friendly AI that augments human intelligence. But just as a statement as well, I mean, we have the head of uh, ethics for AI at the IEEE on our board. I mean, we, we build it right into the core of everything we're doing. 
And yeah. so uh, we we have ethical committees and everything around it. And uh, we've got we're working with Yale and MIT and UCL and uh, Berkeley and Stanford on all these things. So it, exactly at the very core of it, because this is the hottest stuff on the planet and uh, done badly uh, <laughs> could bite us, you know. But again, if we look back over the course of evolution, we've gone from single cell organisms to fish to reptiles to mammals to apes to humans. I mean, the, the arc of evolution is positive. We do run into problems. We have uh, Hitlers that we got to deal with and we have wars and we got to clean it up and move on. But the force of evolution wins. We're, we're evolving. We're growing. We're, we're going to the stars. We've already seen our science fiction movies with Star Trek and other kinds of things. This is who we're going to become. And uh, we have a rocky 30 years in front of us as we leave the industrial age behind <laughs> and step into this advanced CRISPR, uh, space age, whatever, uh, where we live for three or 400 years each. Uh, that's, but it's coming. There's no stopping it. We're going to do it. We can do it. This is part of our evolutionary journey.